A judge in Zimbabwe has convicted an opposition politician for insulting a Russian national in 2020. The judge also fined Tendai Beatty US $300 and said he could go to jail for three months if he fails to pay the amount. Tendai Ruben Mfana is a Zimbabwe social justice advocate and writer. He tells me the verdict is an embarrassment because it is not a criminal offense under Zimbabwe law to insult someone. What I can say is that it's another outrage for the nation of Zimbabwe, another embarrassment, a huge indictment on our country in general and our judiciary in particular. How can someone be jailed to six months imprisonment or with the option of a fine of 300 US dollars simply for insulting someone. We need to remember what happened in 2020. That is four years ago. Chennai BT encountered this lady. She's a Russian lady who was uh, uh, working in Zimbabwe at the magistrate's courts in Zimbabwe. They had an altercation, and Chennai BT ended up calling her stupid. Yes, that's not acceptable at all. But that can never be a crime in any form, in, especially in Zimbabwe. It's not a criminal offense to call someone stupid. <laughs> but I think I think the judge uh, in, in ruling on this case, uh, in giving that suspended sentence, took note of the fact that uh, BT did apologize, and therefore, don't you think the punishment um, is fair? <laughs> Not at all. It's, it's not fair. He shouldn't be punished at all. Let's remember this, James. This is a court of law, which is supposed to judge issues according with the law. What law is there in Zimbabwe that criminalizes insulting someone? If she had been assaulted, if BT had laid his hands on her, that would have been a totally different issue. But insulting someone as opposed to assaulting them is totally different. The judge should have just thrown this case out four years ago. Question. So um, if you say it's not fair, what is BT's lawyer or what is BT, who himself is a lawyer, what is he planning on doing? Yes, he's going to file an in a, in a appeal with a higher court because they are also standing on what I've been saying, that, no, it's unfair. It really, what the magistrate court ruled is unfair. There's no law that we can even think about that will say, well, how can you find someone guilty of insulting someone? So, Bitty's lawyer is going to take the issue to a higher court. I want to ask, BT is supposed to be one of the leaders of the newly reorganized Citizens Coalition for Change. That's the opposition. What is the opposition saying about the sentencing? So far, the only comments that I've uh, come across, they're also outraged. But as you understand that the, the triple C, the opposition now, it's in disarray. So we can only expect a comment from the faction that is Wolfsburg, Mengube, Tendai Biti, and Jacob Mafume. The others, uh, I don't expect them to comment at all. You know, they might actually be celebrating wherever they are and even wishing that Tendai Biti had actually been jailed. Zimbabwe's social justice advocate and writer, he was speaking with us from the capital, Horare. Uganda is planning to relocate its only maximum security prison to give way to a luxury five-star hotel. Luzera Maximum Security Prison, located near the capital Kampala, houses both men and women. Local media report the facility will be turned into a five-star hotel by the Chinese Tian Tang Group. Citing a letter by President Yoweri Museveni, Ugandan political analyst Charles Mwanguya Mpagi tells viewers Douglas Mpoga that uh, there is a concern about the government's practice of giving away public land to private investors. It's been a mixed reaction. There are people who believe that the relocation is uh, okay happening at this time, but the question is, this is the only national security prison that you have in the country and very close to the city center, less than 10 kilometers out of the city center. And the question is, why Luzira Maximum Security Prison? You have a huge shoreline along Lake Victoria and areas that are accessible where a beautiful hotel facility can be developed. Why are you giving away Luzira Maximum Security Prison? With its history, its historical significance, and the need for relocation and the justification for 
having located the maximum security prison there. So there are people questioning what the rationale is, and many people are saying, are you just looking at uh, another land giveaway, like has happened to other public lands, or are you doing it for a genuinely good reason? And we understand it's being uh, given to a Chinese investor, is that correct? Yes, in May 2022, that's when the president wrote to the Minister for Internal Affairs and said uh, he had been approached by the director of Tian Tiang Group. This is a Chinese company that's been involved in the manufacture of uh, steel. It's involved in the manufacture of mattresses and many other things. And I think running some hotels in town already. He said they had approached him and said they were interested in developing a five-star hotel on the land currently occupied by Luzira Maximum Security Prison and that they would relocate or rebuild the prison at any other site at their own cost. And that's what the president wrote to the Minister for Internal Affairs. And the minister wrote back, and uh, he was inviting a discussion on how uh, this relocation happened. So in the mind of government, it appears like it's a decision made. It's not even just a consultation. And what uh, the people's reaction to a prime land being given out to foreign investors, especially Chinese farms, without their input, the people's input? There's been a lot of debate in Uganda, not just about this one, and this one is just adding to a discussion that's been going on in the country. They call it, there is a word, they call it a land bonanza. Government is giving away prime public land. Now, the question sometimes that arises is, are you actually giving it to a genuine, legitimate foreign or local investor? President Macky Sall's initiative to convene a dialogue in Dakar has culminated in significant developments for Senegal's political landscape. The conclusion of the dialogue on Tuesday revealed two crucial outcomes that are set to shape the nation's electoral future. The first focal point of discussion revolved around the electoral process. Participants deliberated on the status of candidates, particularly distinguishing between those whose candidacies were upheld by the Constitutional Council and those deemed as spoiled candidates. In a bid to ensure fairness and inclusivity, it was agreed that the Constitutional Council would re-evaluate the applications of the spoiled candidates, potentially affording them the opportunity to participate in the forthcoming presidential election. The second major deliberation centered on determining the election date after careful consideration and dialogue. Consensus emerged around setting June 2nd as the date for the presidential election. President Macky Sall emphasizing the importance of conducting the electoral process before the onset of the rainy season in June had set the stage for this decision and the beginning of the dialogue. With the dialogue now conducted, all attention turns to President Macky Sall for the final validation of the decisions reached during the discussions. The nation eagerly awaits his response to the proposals put forth by the participants. The outcome of this pivotal dialogue is anticipated to pave the way for a transparent and inclusive electoral process, reinforcing Senegal's commitment to democratic principles. Thank you so much for watching and peace.